and welcome to 303. We are in Senior English A, and we now turn to a close analysis of the King James 1611 version of the Bible. I'm with you in your hymnals on 296, 297 and following. And our project now, I've already given an introductory lecture to some of the background to understanding the uh, composition of the biblical text the uh, 586 uh, BCE exile and some of those kinds of concerns. Now I want to turn specifically to this text, the King James Version of the Bible. Let's begin with our essential question on page 296, and let's just take a few notes as we get ready now uh, for our study. The King James Bible has been for centuries an important book for many Protestants. As you read, identify qualities of language rhythm that contribute to the appeal and influence of this great prose work. This will help you answer the essential question, how does literature shape or reflect society? Let's jump down really quickly to 2B. You definitely want to get this information at literary analysis at 2B there. Notice there are at least three or more of these bold words that we want to make sure that we have uh, written down. The Bible conveys themes of faith, in a few genres, including these, the Psalms, sacred songs or lyric poems in praise of God, sermons, speeches offering religious or moral instruction, the Sermon on the Mount contains the basic teachings of Christianity, parables, simple stories from which a moral or religious lesson can be drawn, the most famous are in the New Testament. Let's talk about comparing literary works for just a moment. Read with me on 296. Psalms, sermons, parables all convey deep messages about life, each communicates a message in a manner suited to its form. Psalms are songs to engage an audience. Psalms may feature vivid figurative language, including, let's write it down, metaphors, comparisons of unlike things, to help listeners understand. Sermons may feature analogies. Let's write that one down. Um, explanations comparing abstract relationships to familiar ones. Parables are narratives, that is to say, stories illustrating a message. As you read, Compare the methods by which each selection conveys its message and the appeal and effectiveness of each. As we read these few passages from the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, let's pay attention to a reading strategy. There it is on page 296. Read it with me. In some portions of the Bible, the main idea is implied rather than directly stated. You can determine the main idea by making inferences, identifying key details in the text, and then relating them to other details and to your own experience. When making inferences, consider what the text suggests as well as what it leaves uncertain. And then, of course, the chart to the right there. I do highly recommend that maybe you give some time to a chart like that as you go through your annotative process at level 1 and 2A. The vocabulary words are listed for you at 296. There are five of them. I recommend that you write those down right now and make sure that you prepare for the examination through the analysis study of those words. Obviously, be looking for those words when we see them here in a few moments in our study. Let's jump over to 296 really quickly. The first thing that I need you to write down again, if you haven't already done it, is that when we talk about the King James Bible, we are talking about the year 1611. You want to write that year down. 1611. Now, to help you place that date... Think of it this way, Shakespeare, we believe, will write and perform Hamlet for the first time on stage 1600. So we're talking about the King James Version of the Bible 11 years after Hamlet. And the King James Version of the Bible, as we've said in an earlier lecture, is the great standardizer of the language. No question, it will begin the process of standardization of the English language. So, for example, if you want to speak appropriately or write appropriately the English language, you speak and sound like you are basically writing and sounding right out of the King James uh, Version of the Bible. When you were juniors and you watched that performance of Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, and they kept talking with that thee and thou and they said, some of you were saying, well, you know, when they talk, it sounds like they're talking right out of the Bible. The reason for that is they're talking right out of the Bible. That is to say the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Let's go ahead and read now on page 297. For centuries, the Bible was the cornerstone of European culture, the ultimate reference for rulers and priests, the ultimate authorization of laws, religious practices, a treasury of images and subjects for art. Yet the book was inaccessible to the majority of Europeans. During the Reformation in the 1500s, the need for a closer study of the Bible 
was widely acknowledged, which led to translations of the work into the vernacular or common languages. For the first time, this grounding work became widely accessible. The King James Bible, the authoritative English translation, was created at the command of King James I. In 1604, let's write that date down. In 1604, James commissioned 54 scholars, let's write that number down, and clergymen to compare all known texts of the Bible and prepare the definitive English translation. Let's talk about early Bibles for a moment under that heading. The Bible. A collection of books developed over more than 1,200 years consists of two main parts, the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, and the New Testament, written in Greek. In about 8405, St. Jerome finished translating the Bible into Latin. This translation, called the Vulgate, you might want to write that down, the Vulgate, remained the standard Bible of the West for centuries. King James translators, though, were to review the original sources as well as translations of the word. Let's go ahead and look under the heading of systematic plan. I hope you're reading with me. The project was carefully organized from the start. The books of the Bible were divided among six groups of scholars in Westminster, Oxford, Cambridge. The groups took four years to produce their initial drafts. Then two scholars from each region spent nine months in London reviewing and revising the draft. After laboring for seven years, the group produced one of the great works of English literature. The King James Bible has been called, quote, the only classic ever created by a committee, in quote. Tyndale's legacy, the last heading. The King James Bible was not the first English translation of the book. James's translators were greatly influenced by William Tyndale's translation. Tyndale, a Protestant chaplain and tutor in England, fled clerical oppression at home and published his translation of the New Testament in Germany. Before he had completed work on the Old Testament, however, he was arrested for heresy and executed near Brussels, Belgium in 1536. Amazing. You could end up toast on a post for translating the Bible back in 1536. Amazing. Some students will report things have changed a little bit. Let's look at the last paragraph. As England became more Protestant, Tyndale came to be viewed not as a heretic but as a hero. King James's committee closely followed the magnificent diction and rhythms of Tyndale's groundbreaking translation. Of course, you have a drawing there on 297. There's your title page of the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Let's now turn to page 299. We're going to look at our first of four selections from the King James Version of the Bible. Now, just to be clear so that there's no confusion. There are two ways to look at a religious text. One, like the Bible. One is to study it as a religious text. The second is to study it as a literary text. We are clearly looking at this text as a literary text and not as a religious text. Okay. Another way that we can talk about this, and we mentioned this in another lecture, is to talk about an apologetic approach to this text versus a non-apologetic approach. The apologetic approach is to look at the text and try and argue what's right or wrong with it. Okay? For example, if you study Beowulf, and when we are told that Beowulf swims under the ocean for five days without ever coming up, and we want to make the argument that there is something fundamentally flawed in the idea that Beowulf could hold his breath for five straight days, that is what we call an apologetic study of the text. We're trying to find out what's right or wrong with it. A non-apologetic study of the text is simply to say, what does the text say? And we will simply treat it as a work of literature. So, for example, when we met Beowulf and we were told that he swam into the ocean for five days, we didn't sit and, and debate or discuss whether that was true or not. We simply said, that's what the text tells us. Let's go ahead and talk about the implications. What really does that mean? It's, of course, an Anglo-Saxon way to say that Beowulf is B-A-D, bad, right? Okay, in other words, he's a different kind of superhero. We'll now turn to four passages from the uh, 1611 King James Version of the Bible. And we will be looking at this then not as a religious text, but rather as a literary text. And for our beginning study, let's go ahead and just qualify Psalm 23 as a famous poem. So if we talk about different genres within the biblical text, poetry is one of the famous ones. And we're going to look at maybe the most famous single poem from the biblical text. You might want to write this down, that this is a title that gets read a lot at funerals. In fact, many of you who have never even been exposed to the Bible at all, when you start hearing this reading, you will go, oh, 
I heard that once when I had to go to a funeral. Very, very popular. Let's begin, however, on page 299 with reading background information. Up to the middle 1400s, Bibles were painstakingly copied by hand. The resulting manuscripts, though often quite beautiful, were rare and costly. When the German inventor, Johann Gutenberg, devised the method of printing with movable type, widespread distribution of the Bible began. Psalm 23, Psalm 137 come from the book of Psalms, a section of the Old Testament composed of 150 favorite of, of, um, uh, sacred psalms. Many of the psalms are attributed to David, the young shepherd who killed Goliath and eventually became king of Israel. Psalm 23 is frequently recited at funerals, in times of trouble, and when people are in need of comfort. So let's just write this down really quickly at 2a. This is a poem that we are going to see often referenced when people are not having a very good day, or when people are kind of worried and upset, or when people need some sense of comfort or security. Now we're going to look at the six verses of Psalm 23. Let's just read them together, and let's see how much information you can extract on your own from a reading such as this. Read along with me. I'm on page 299. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now the first place that we want to go with this passage is to actually level to be the rhetorical reading. Let's just point out really quickly some of the strange language that would be 1611 language that for some of you immediately you're going to say reminds me of Shakespeare. For example, did you notice in verse 2, look at it really quickly, that the word is not make, but maketh. Do you see it? Maketh. Now what's up with this maketh thing? Let's point out that there's a certain kind of rhythm in the language when we get the second syllable with the TH added to the word make. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He, look at the next one, leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth. Do you see it? This is the continuation, so let's put it in our notes at 2B. We clearly are creating some kind of suffix at the end of some of our verbs to give a certain kind of rhythm to the language. Look at verse 4. Whoa, what is up with the word yea? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yay? Now that is not our word yay as in yippee. No, 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 no. This is a different word. This is the word that's almost like a placeholder. Again, we're worrying about the rhythm of the language. The word yay here is almost like an, the word alas. I'll make a 3A observation. The word alas in T.S. In T.S. Eliot's hollow men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dry voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless. This word yea is almost like this. <sighs> Again, the idea is when things are going really bad and you need some kind of comfort, what is the message of this poem? Well, let's take a look at it and let's work through it. Notice, first of all, and we can say this at both level 1 and at 2a, we are dealing with a word picture. We're going to write this down. A word picture of a shepherd with his sheep. Now, for the people to whom this kind of passage is going to be predominantly created, that is to say, those Hebrews or Jews, as we mentioned in another lecture, these are people who obviously know a whole lot about taking care of tending sheep. Okay? Sheep, as we have pointed out before in other lectures, are not a very bright animal. For some of us who have, for example, had, um, you know, 
uh, projects where we had to take care of animals when we were children. I've had a number of my seniors that report sheep are about the stupidest animal imaginable and they have to be taken care of or they will just kind of wander off and get dead really fast. So notice here the opening line, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, this is a word picture that says God is like a shepherd to the sheep, namely to humans who wish comfort. Notice, I shall not want here, let's put it in our notes at level one, simply means I will not need anything. I will not desire anything. And then we're told that this shepherd allows for you to lie down in, notice the word pictures, green pastures, still waters. Okay. Now, for a people who have spent a lot of their time living in what we out in Wyoming call the Badlands, where there's not a lot of green and there's not very much water, this is, of course, going to then idealize a somewhat perfect setting. So let's write that down. This is the attempt to suggest that things are going to get better. And in this culture, the way you would reference that to things, green grass and lots of water that's nice and still. Verse 3, the restoration of the soul. Let's jot it down at 3a when we start comparing to other titles. When we meet Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey later in Senior English B, Wordsworth will argue that you can restore the soul and thereby improve your mood. Notice the same idea is going to be presented here. The restoration of the soul, notice at verse 3, and then do you see the colon? Right? After he restores my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is, of course, the argument that if you walk along the path correctly, you don't fall off to either side and get dead. In other words, the idea here is, I know I can be a better person. And this will, of course, become a very interesting idea through the ages. The idea of, let's write it down, self-improvement through some kind of act of faith. Right? Verse 4 suggests that there is no fear. You're maybe familiar with those t-shirts of a long time ago that used to say no fear. Maybe without realizing it, you didn't know that this is where this came from, this notion. Look at it. Yea means even, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil then notice after the word evil, a colon. Do you see it? We're, we're reading very closely here in the 1611, aren't we? For, though, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In other words, a shepherd would carry these instruments that he would reach out and then knock the sheep to keep him on the path so that the sheep didn't fall off and get hurt or whatever. So the word picture continues here at verse 4. Even though I come to death, I will not fear. This idea of not fearing in the time of terrible, terrible suffering makes sense if you go back to an earlier lecture when we are talking about that time of tremendous exile when people are taken out of the city of Zion or Jerusalem and led far, far away and they have to live somewhere else in a terrible place. This idea that even in the moment of greatest, greatest trial, death, I still will be okay. I'm going to be taken care of. We can jot down here really quickly at, three, at 3A. Another observation. Think about that death scene in Beowulf Part 3, right? Beowulf has been bitten by the dragon. He will die. How does he die? We could argue that he dies without fear. And notice we have the same hope here as well. Verse 5 is an interesting word picture. We shift the word picture away from sheep and a shepherd now to something else. Thou means you, and let's put that in our notes. This word thou means you. Of course, we're familiar with this language from Shakespeare, aren't we, when we see the Shakespeare plays. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. We see the TH at the end of run as well. Did you see it? Runneth over to get that kind of rhythm. Three observations of verse 5 that we want to point out for your notes. Notice the first one. If you live in a culture where food is a huge commodity, sitting at a table with a lot of food around you 
is going to be something you dream about, okay? Notice here two things. One, a full table is prepared for me. Notice in this rendition, this is the first two words of the psalm, the Lord or God. In other words, I'm going to, I'm going to be prepared at my table with lots and lots to eat. But notice it is lots to eat in the presence of my enemies, in other words, there's a word picture going on here. If you want to subjugate people and remind them that they're subjugated, you starve them. You do not allow them to have a lot to eat. You give them a little bit of bread, maybe a little bit of water, and that's all they get to eat. So the word picture here is, I am going to have this huge table of food in front of me, and now the roles will be reversed, and the people who are my enemies, that is to say, don't treat me well, they're going to get to sit and watch me Eat. Now, this is an important uh, reference, and it is a powerful image. Let's jump to 3A again. One of the reasons I'm making so many 3A observations is our 1611 King James Version of the Bible will have prodigious influence on writers going forward. Langston Hughes writes a famous poem called I, Too, that maybe you'll remember studying in your junior year of American English, in which he says, They will send me to the kitchen when company comes, but I'll eat and grow strong. There will come a day, he says, however, when I don't go to the kitchen to eat. The idea is sitting at a table full of food is proof that you are no longer subjugated. And so there's a hope here of eating in front of enemies. Of course, this makes total sense if you are a people who have been exiled away from your home and are being treated really badly. Notice the final one about this is a strange word picture. And if you don't understand it, it's not going to make any sense at all. The idea of anointing my head with oil and the idea of my cup runs over. Two observations. One, back during the time that this is written and purported to be written as we read to a man named David who ultimately becomes the great king, in the David story, we're actually told that if you want to become king, you have to kneel. And instead of being knighted like we do with a sword, for example, in the English tradition, oil is poured 